This is class 155 on the Golden Doves. Welcome to Torah Tandalus. For those of you who are new, I just want to let you know that um, what we do in Torah Tandalus is we study Torah in a very deep and a very, um, I would say, highly intellectual way. Um, so this is not a this is not um, a channel where it's going to be like a quick inspiration. It would be inspirational, but the inspiration you would get from learning this is going to be a very deep type of inspiration where hopefully you can change your intellectual apparatus and learn to think like a Jew, right? And that's not easy. So this isn't like, you know, sometimes people like a quick workout, it's two minutes on this machine and you just like a 45 mile run or whatever. <laughs> we're not into that. You know, we're into actual, <clears throat> so in the case of Talmud Torah, Yagata umasata tamin. If you make an effort and you really try to study something, you can learn something, right? Like, Quick inspiration is great, nothing wrong with that, it, but it's just, it leaves as quickly as it came, right? You know, something more profound, something deeper that can ch change your intellectual apparatus, that actually stays. So that's what this station is about. Not, again, we're not against quick inspiration. I myself like hearing these motivational two minute clips, do it all the time. But for a lasting effect, this is the channel to be on. In order to sew her page 86 in the Golden Doves, we're talking about how the Bi Akiva came out with the idea of taking the Torah Shabbat Al which until this time had no fixed formula, but rather one can express the laws contained in the Torah Shabbat Al as one would wish to express those laws and make his own composition. Comes the Bi Akiva and says, Well, let's make a fixed composition where there is a fixed text, and when you're teaching a law, you teach a law not just conceptually, but you teach the fixed text, the written composition, right? So in order to salvage, <clears throat> we're discussing that now, in order to salvage a modicum of Jewish autonomy, political necessity required the collecting and authoritative transmission of the pronouncements of the rabbis in precise terminology. So we're dealing here with the days where the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed the Beit HaMikdash, the Sanhedrin was on its uh, land, had to leave Jerusalem, and it went from city to city to city. And the Rabbein Rabbi Akiva realized that this is going to be the end but Minan, but <coughs> of Jewish autonomy. We would no longer have a state, we would no longer have the instruments that a state has. So the purpose of composing the Torah of al to a fixed written text called the Mishnayot, was that now the authority, instead of the authority lying in the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish um, legislator, um, the authority would lie in the Mishnah, which is the text, right? Indeed, a rabbinic tradition reports that all the exiles would not be gathered in if not for the merit of the Mishnayot. So you see how um, many Chachamim agreed with Rabbi Noah Kadosh, and they said that this endeavor to compose the Mishnayot was of utmost importance, right? And that Bishut, the, the Mishnayot, um, that's why they would be Kibbutz uh, Galuyot. This ideology was finally realized with the formulation of the Mishnah by, by Judah the Prince. And then a few generations after the Biakiva, the Biakiva started the project, but it was a multi generational project, which ended with Rabbi Noah Kadosh. He's the one who actually finalized. Um, or, or he completed the final version of the uh, text of the Mishnah. This realization also eclipsed our knowledge of other forms of rabbinic tradition, right? So now, because because the focus, the entire focus was on the Mishnayot, well, there was a certain, let's say, uh, no, nothing is perfect in the world. Anytime you have a decision to make, there's always going to be negatives and positives. So one of the negatives of doing the Mishnayot is that now everything became focused around the Mishnah. Well, anything that didn't get inserted or didn't become part of the Mishnah kind of fell by the wayside, right? Or got eclipsed by the Mishnayot. And maybe some of those things that got eclipsed were good, right? Um, most of what is known about the rabbis, including those of the period before the Biakiva comes from his school. What do we know about the period before the Biakiva? What the Biakiva put in the Mishnayot? Right? So, even if it's an opposing tradition, we would only know it through the Biakiva. There are almost no independent sources about other schools and traditions. What happened to everybody else? There was many great Chachamim, but we don't have their traditions because of the Biakiva. 
his composition, the Mishnah, eventually finished by the Ben Wakadosh, was what was in what was known, right? Because that's what stayed. Uh, the controversies recorded in rabbinic literature between Rabbi Akiva and his contemporaries, such as that with Rabbi Ishmael, are minor. Now, you, you rarely see any machlokot between Rabbi Akiva and others, right? Because naturally, the Mishnayot reflects the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. And sometimes, even when you have a machlokot, the machlokot wouldn't be a huge machlokot between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael. But it would be like a slight variation of what the halacha should be. And but, uh, and but slight variations of what in effect represents the ideologies, ideologies associated with the Biyakov. So even when he brings a machloket, he won't bring somebody who completely disagrees with him, but rather it will be somebody who agrees with the basic notions of the Biyakiva, but there's some nuances that there's disagreements on. But there was other hachamim who had different opinions on things. You don't know about them. Only a few hints radically critical of Rabbi Akiva have been preserved, but somehow we still do have some of the criticism, some of the people who disagree with Rabbi Akiva. The following, among others, are indicative. The puzzling remark, this is the Gemara Masechet Sota, says that the Tana withers the world. Well, that's a strong statement. The Tana, meaning the person who, who, who learns these formulations, he kind of is bringing about the withering of the world. Oh, boy. An allusion to the establishment of the official transmitters, which is a formulation of all tradition required. So, of course, we could have an official formulation of the oral tradition. There was no printing presses back then. You need to have official transmitters of this official formulation, and they were called the Tanaim, right? <clears throat> all right. The um, footnote here says as follows, footnote 9. This institution was first explicitly mentioned in connection with the Biakiva's disciples, the institution of the Tana, the Tana being the those who would memorize by heart the official formulations. The view that the Tanaim were indicted because they were in the habit of teaching the law authoritatively from Moses is cited in the name of Rabbi Yoshua, who was both the mentor and major supporter of the Biakiva. Um, I'm sorry, I misread that. The view that the Tanaim were indicted because they were in the habit of teaching the law authoritatively from the Mishnah. I'm sorry, I think I said Moses. I don't know, slip of the tongue. Is cited in the name of Rabbi Akiva, who was both the mentor and major support of Rabbi Akiva. The attempt to explain away this indictment rather than merely to reject it or ignore it is evidence of an authoritative tradition. That's very interesting. So this particular statement seems to indict the Tanaim precisely because they're studying Mishnayot or they're formulating or reciting Mishnayot, right? So here we see that there were some Hachamim who didn't necessarily agree with this idea of let's take the Tanah Shabbat which until now was, there was no formulation, let's create this official formulation, the Hachamim were against that. The attempt to explain away this indictment rather than merely to reject it or ignore it is evidence of authoritative uh, origin, right? The fact that they explain what does it mean means that they believe that the indictment itself was authoritative. All right. <clears throat> um, the humorous odd story that when Moses... Um, in a vision, attended a class given by the Biyakiva, could not understand a word. So that's the Gemara Masachim in Achot. Right? So Moshe Rabbeinu goes to a class that the Biyakiva is given, he doesn't understand what the heck the Biyakiva is talking about. <laughs> so, what does that mean? So you see, this is an this is indictment of the Biyakiva. The same thing that the Biyakiva was flagellated several times by, by the Jewish court. They got Malkut when he was younger. Yani, they didn't like him. The incident and the venerable, uh, with the venerable Rabbi Nuhunya bin Akana, <coughs> in which Rabbi Akbar had to climb to the top of a palm tree in order to escape the wrath of the guards. That's in Masechet Megillah. I think there was also something like that in the, uh, in the Sifre, where in order to escape the wrath of the uh, guards, of, because he, Rabbi Nuhunya perceived Rabbi Akbar to be disrespectful, so he had his uh, guards come after him. Laban Gamliel's vehement protest to Rabbi Akiva. Also, Laban Gamliel protested to Rabbi Akiva. How could your heart have dared to transgress the words of your colleagues? 
So here you see Rabbi Akiva was not held in highest, um, was not, uh, what Rabbi Akiva was doing was not held in high esteem. His clash with, with Rabbi Yosef and Kisma, ending with a short comment, Akiva, I would be surprised if they, the Romans, do not burn you together with the scroll of the Torah. Wow, that's a pretty strong indictment. El Hazit, Rabbi Akiva, was Asalaru Gemal Chut, he died in the worst, worst type of, uh, of torture ever, right? The bitter remark by the Bieli Azim bin Horkanus branded a Shema'ite and excommunicated at his deathbed, deathbed, announcing to Biakiva that he and his associates will suffer a horrible death. So the Bieli Azim bin Horkanus, one of the last things he uttered from his mouth was how to Biakiva, but Minan, but it happened, was going to suffer a horrible death. And we know what happened that day. He used Masrekot She Barzel, Elohim Ishmor. They used a hot iron, burning uh, iron comb to, 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 to tear off his uh, skin. Your death will be more horrendous than theirs. And Rabbi Eliezer says, brother, you could have the worst type of death. But all the people that are going to be killed, yours will be the worst. Also, his complaint that he was seldom asked to teach his, his traditions. Rabbi Akiva is complaining why he doesn't get the opportunity to teach his traditions. So you see there was some opposition to him teaching his traditions. The conspicuous absence of any halach, halachic teaching by such saintly figures as Choni Amiagel. Why doesn't Choni Amiagel have any halachot? Apparently, the halachot of Choni Amiagel were not aligned with the halachot of Rabbi Akiva, and that's why he's not mentioned. Not because he didn't have anything to say, because Rabbi Akiva didn't include it in the collection. Rabbi Hanina bin Osa, also another great, 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 great Tanna, nothing. Nachum Ish Ganzu, right? One of Rabbi Akiva's earlier teachers, maybe of their halachic. Maybe because my father speculates that because their halachic views and traditions were not acceptable to this school. So, because the Biakiva school didn't accept their views and traditions, we have nothing left of them. The same may have been the, the, same may have been the case with Rabbi Al Azal bin Araf, the most prestigious disciple of Rabbi Yohanan bin Zakai, and Rabbi Yohanan bin Akana, also a people of Rabbi Yohanan bin Zakai. Maybe Rabbi Al Azal bin Araf did have traditions, but apparently we, we, we can speculate. That those traditions were not aligned what, with what Rabbi Akiva was doing. Okay.